Hi, my name is Josh Potter, and I'm the lead pastor here at Sioux City First Church. I want to take a moment to thank you for watching today's video. I truly hope that you find it life-giving, challenging, and encouraging. We do want to get to know you beyond a YouTube video, so I want to encourage you, go and visit our website, SiouxCityFirst.org. You'll find lots of information there, ways to connect with us, ways to give to support what we're doing here at the church. But just want to give you an opportunity to get to know us a little bit more by going to the website. Once again, we'd love to meet you in person and hopefully you can join us soon. Otherwise, go visit our website. We hope that you have a great week and we hope that you're inspired by today's message. Thank you. Have a great week. Well, alrighty, it is good to have you here this morning. Uh, I want to get started. I have four pages of notes, so we should be out of here around one o'clock today. Um, we'll see how it goes, uh, but I'm excited to be with you. Uh, man, this week, uh, wow, what a week. We, uh, we got to truly see evil on display once again. And um, once again, the need to pray for our country. I can't emphasize enough praying for our country. We're not a perfect people, but we are a great country to be a part of. And I, I want to just encourage you as we saw what unfolded this week, once again... We're doing a series here called Chaos in the Comment Section, and guess what happened right after it ha- what, after the shooting? Gun control, gun rights, let the debate begin. Almost instantly, right after the shooting happens. And it's chaos in the comment section one more time, and people sharing their opinions and their thoughts. Or, this is my right, this is, what, this is what we should do for gun control, and everybody has all their thoughts and opinions about it. And once again, I will never, it's not my job as a pastor to tell you, you cannot have an opinion. You can have as many opinions as you want to. I encourage you as your pastor to have informed and wise opinions. But once again, we all have opinions, and we need to remind ourselves that just because you have an opinion doesn't mean it needs to be shared. I have some really good friends and a brother, and I have other friends that I like to send text messages to throughout the week, whether it be something sports-related, politically-related, whatever it is, and I'll, I can share my opinions that way, and that's okay. Um, and I feel like privately that's a, that's a good way for me to do that. I think sometimes we share things publicly that probably should have been shared more privately. So we, we just need to be wise. The vibe of the series that we're trying to have here at the church is one of love. We want to love people, not condemn people. We want to condemn sin. But we currently live in culture, and the culture that you and I breathe right now is that wrong is right and right is wrong. And we have to muddle through cultural issues to see what's true and what's not true. What's a biblical worldview versus some of these topics we've been talking about over the last few weeks. And so I want to remind you that even though some of these things are controversial, just because it's controversial, it doesn't mean that God's word isn't clear. God's word is clear on things, and we need to look to that. I want to, I want to remind you that in John chapter 1, we see something. If you want to turn there, you can really quickly. But that Jesus is the standard for all objective truth. Truth is not subjective in a world created and ruled by the Word of God. John 1, 1 through 3, here's what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. From the beginning, Jesus was there. Believe that Jesus is truth. Okay? So, all ideologies that you may have or I may have, all ideologies and structures and ethics and philosophies are judged according to the standard of God's Word, the 66 books of the Bible. A couple verses we've been looking at each and every week, uh, we want to look at James chapter 1, or excuse me, yeah, James chapter 1, 19 and 20. If you remember what it says, this is an underliner verse. It says this, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. When he says take note, write it down. Remember it, this is important. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. 
because human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Your human anger, my human anger, lashing out doesn't create the righteousness or the right living that God desires for you or for me. So, quick to listen, slow to speak. You've heard it before. God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Colossians 4, verse number 5 and 6. Be wise. I imagine everybody in this room wants to be wise in how they live their life. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, toward non-believers. Make the most of every opportunity ministering to them. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. We need to be wise in how we interact with one another. A lot of times we just have, you know, and we saw this, we just kind of the knee-jerk reactions, the knee-jerk anger to situations. I want to remind you of a verse we looked at at our Wednesday night Bible study in James chapter 2, verse number 12. It says this, it says that we are to speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. And the, the intent and what, we, what that means is this, speak and act as if you're about ready to be judged by God. That might change the way we live our lives. That may change the way we behave. Speak and act. Behave in a way as if you're about to be judged by God. Now, over the last several weeks, we've been looking at different topics. We talked about gender and sexuality. We talked about abortion last week. This week, we're going to talk about critical race theory. It's, it's, it's something that really, over the last couple years, has really become just uh, national news. And it's become really wildly popular uh, not popular necessarily as much as it, it's just really uh, spoken about over and over and over and over. And a lot of people have different understandings of what it really means. Even when I was running for the school board, I would have people who would always say, are you for or are you against critical race theory? Something that in Iowa is illegal to teach in our school anyway. And so are you, are you for, or some, uh, for or against something that's illegal to teach in Iowa? Then there's the question of if it's sneaking its way in in different ways. And there's lots of people out there who, who have videos and said, here's how we're getting it in, all that, whatever. But critical race theory really actually began in the mid-60s. And it was an, a way for law schools to kind of find ways to determine or to understand what are the long-term effects of policies, of systematic policies, over a long period of time. What's going to happen if policies are created in a systematic way that are going to potentially harm people? Okay, law, you know, slavery, Jim Crow laws, things like that, that African Americans only represent, you know, certain percents of a people or two-fifths or three-fifths, whatever it is. How, how, how does that affect people long term? Or how does that affect us? How does that affect policy? And so critical race theory really is just kind of a small, a, a small portion of, of what you might call critical social justice, which it's really attached to postmodern theory, uh, attached to, to Marxism. And, and so let's look a little bit at that. But I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of framework when it comes, when you hear the term social justice or critical race theory, just for your mind, mind to understand too, social justice is focused more on class Okay, it separates people by classes. Critical race theory focuses more on, on race and, and race alone. Oppressed, oppre oppressor, oppressed. Okay? And what happens in critical race theory is, I want you to imagine, I don't have my glasses with me this morning, but critical race theory is looking at life through a lens. And when I look at life through this lens, what I'm doing is everything that I see has race attached to it. Everywhere I look, I'm looking through a lens and I'm looking for racism. And then once you find it, you, you try to make some policies to, to change it. Okay? And when you look through a lens of racism and, and all you're looking for is racism, guess what? You'll find it. It's just like anything else. If you want to be mad at your spouse, you got reasons. Have you ever been looking for a new car or wanted a new car before? 
I remember there's a couple times I've recently bought cars in the last several years, and when you do, I'm like, oh, I kind of like this. When I was looking for the Traverse I was looking for, everywhere I went, I started to see Chevy Traverses. If you are looking for something, it's the same way with being offended. You don't have to look very hard for that, but, but if you want to be offended, everywhere you look, you can, you can find it pretty easy. And then things like George Floyd happened right around the two-year anniversary of George Floyd, and that just made racial tensions explode in our country in just some massive ways. We saw, we saw the justification, and this is more of a social justice thing, the justification of burning down cities and ruining cities and all that because there's this retribution that needs to happen for racism. And, and so critical social justice is kind of that tear it down mentality, burn it down, ruin everything mindset. I want you to imagine every single American being on a really, really, really large boat saying, you know what, this boat wasn't built right. Let's destroy the boat and while we're treading water, we'll build a new one. Doesn't really work that way. Maybe you've remodeled a home before and there are good things about it that you can build off of. Our country has plenty of really good things about it that we can build on, but critical social justice is really about we need to tear everything down. One of the challenges, and I'm just kind of trying to be informative mostly, a lot of critical race theory presumes that every white person is racist. It's impossible for them not to be racist. That's what I believe is one of the, the bad parts about it. There would be people, and, and one of the terms you've probably heard in the last several years is white nationalism. And I could probably, we could probably have a four week series on white nationalism and, and the culture's perception of that. There are people who would, because we showed a video this morning honoring our troops, and honoring America, they would see that as we value America more than we value God. It's, it's na- nation first, America first, God and anything else separate from that. But critical race theory presumes that every single white person is racist. So think of it this way. If you, go to, if you work at a grocery store and you're white and an African American walks in and a, and a white person walks in, if you help the African American per, this is kind of with the critical race mindset. If you help the African American per, person first, what you're believing is that they're going to steal something, so that's why you're going to them first. If you don't help, if you help the white person first before the African American person, then you're ignoring the African American person. It's looking for every opportunity to see racism, and it, and it just it's tribalism. At its worst, it's you're either an oppressor or you're the oppressed, one of the two, white or black. So once again, social justice, it does it by class. Straight, gay, able-bodied, disabled, socioeconomic uh, uh, variables or rationales that people use. One of the ways people think that critical race theory is getting into it, so the big, I think the big debate has been, a lot of the big debate that I've noticed anyway, it's, all, it's been on college campuses for a while, but now it's getting into K through 12, and should it be in K through 12 education? Then people would say, well, they're sneaking it in in different ways, diversity, equity, inclusion, all these different things. We know diversity, we've heard about diversity for several years now. Think of diversity, think of equity, uh, equity, uh, more equal outcomes, not necessarily equality, but it's equal outcomes, not opportunities, inclusion, everyone, everyone's included. There is no doubt that people have struggles in this life. There's no doubt that people hurt in this life. And they've been, some people are given a certain deck of cards and some are just absolutely terrible and miserable. And some of that's by race and some of that's not by race. I think we would be wrong to say that racism doesn't exist. It's clear to me in my life, I've only been alive 40 some years, racism still exists and there's some ugliness. There's obviously ugliness that attached to it. 
And racism is wrong. I believe racism is a sin. And I'll, I'll show you in scripture here in just a few moments why I believe that. There are people who are unashamedly racist. As we think of other countries, racism exists in other countries as well. I think most people believe that we're by far the most racist country. A lot of people would believe that mentality. So the idea is if we're going to put this so much in our our country and in our educational systems, and if we are doing that, then how much does that really improve the skills of our kids? How does critical race theory help my kids or your kids if that's happening? How does that help my kid learn how to read? If there's any teachers in the room or you've spent any time in education, um, there's plenty of kids from every ethnicity that can't read. Does this... How, how does this improve the skills that people need in their everyday lives and the things they need to learn for the futures that they're going to face? So I want us to think of a couple ways. Are there any ways that critical race theory and the gospel or biblical worldview would line up together? A couple real quick thoughts about that before we dive into the scriptures. The first thing I think we need to think about is Jesus came and connected with oppressed people. And that's essentially what critical race theory attempts to do through race. Another uh, another way is this. We should be watchful for the different ways in which sinful attitudes and prejudices can become a part of our society and a part of our lives. Again, you and I need to think. You need to look within your own heart. Okay? I can't be the judge of what's happening in you. You can't be the judge of what's happening in me. If we have anything in us, it is good for us to look within our hearts and ask God to purify us if there's anything there that shouldn't be. The other thing that we believe is that all people were created equal. All people were created in the image of God. You were and I were. I am. We're all created in the image of God. All humanity... We're one. So, I want to share a few things from a a scripture standpoint, but one of the most fundamental errors of the sin of racism is that race is biologic, a race is a biologically significant factor in determining identity. And I think this is the same thing that I talked about a few weeks ago with gender and sexuality. Sexual orientation is who you're attracted to. Gender is who you are. And what happens in in the mindset of that that philosophy, in, in critical race theory, your identity is wholly wrapped up in your race and seeing everything through the lens of race. It doesn't mean that race isn't important, doesn't play an important role in your life, helping us to understand cultural, experiential differences among people. But I believe, and I could be wrong, that there is nothing fundamentally fundamentally different between two humans belonging to different races. There's nothing different about them. The church has always been called to speak up against injustice and oppression from the very beginning. We've been called as a church to speak out against injustice and oppression, and we should continue to do so. Anytime we see a group of people marginalized or undermined because of skin color, Um, social class, gender, age, any of that stuff, the church should be, have a united voice calling for justice. I truly believe that. I'm going to show you that in scripture. I'm going to be going through several scriptures in the next few moments. You can turn there if you're really, really fast. Otherwise, you can look on the screen, write it down on a sheet of paper. 
But I, wanna, I just want to share a few verses and a few thoughts around this idea of race in Scripture. Psalm 82, 3, it says, Defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. This doesn't talk about, this doesn't say specific race. This just says what we're supposed to do as men and women of God. We're supposed to defend the weak and fatherless. Those people who are put in positions, some people put in positions because of their race, we need to defend, uphold the cause of the poor, uphold the cause of the oppressed. That's part of our role as men and women of God. Ultimately, Jesus is the bridge. Jesus is the one who brings us together. When you think of one of the biggest uh, groups of people we see in the New Testament, tribalism we see in the New Testament is, is um, Jew versus Gentile. Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier and dividing wall of hostility. I want you to imagine for a second. I know it's just kind of a dream. How different would America look if there was zero, absolutely zero racism? I've asked the question before, what would our country look like if we actually followed the Ten Commandments? In James, uh, he's addressing kind of a rich versus poor mentality, but I think it's a principle in Scripture. And here's what he says in James chapter 2, verse 1. He says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Others say partiality. We're not supposed to show favoritism to anybody. For whatever reason. Verse 8, it says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing it right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Looking at groups of people, making judgment, showing favoritism to one over the other. We're not supposed to hate people. 1 John 4 Verse number 20, speaking to men and women of God, it says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar, for whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Uh, I don't remember who I was talking to. It seemed like it seemed like it was out in the foyer, but I don't remember. I was talking about uh, an African-American gentleman who lived here in Sioux City a long, long, long time ago. But he couldn't live in the city. He had to live out by the train. He had to live outside of town. Almost, uh, it, it was basically he was <laughs> segregated outside of the community because if he came and lived amongst the people, this is a long, long, long time ago. But we we understand how how that went. There were schools that were segregated. There are even people today advocating for the segregation of schools. It's hatred of other people. We can't do that. This is, this is one of my mine, and, and obviously, I don't think this is any surprise to anybody this morning. I'm white, okay? <laughs> that shouldn't be a surprise here. I'm white. I'm a white person speaking on behalf of race. And I know, so that in, in and of itself uh, causes trouble for some people. I, I, I recently watched a minister say, he's my age, and saying, because of what's happened in the past, I'm part of the problem. And I want to just speak to that for a second, and I believe the Bible speaks to that in Deuteronomy. There's a belief that if you're born white, you're guilty of the sins of past generations who happen to have the same skin color. My dad's white, my grandma and grandpa are down the list. Um, that essentially, if my dad was a racist, I need to ask forgiveness for my racism because my dad was a racist, or maybe my grandpa was a racist, or my great-grandpa was a racist. In Deuteronomy 24, 18, here's what it says. It says, Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each one will die for their own sin. I'm responsible for my sin, not my dad's sin. If my dad was racist and taught me to be racist, then obviously I would have some issues that I need to deal with. 
But I believe one of the fundamental problems with critical race theory is that it presumes because you were born white, something's completely out of your control, that you're guilty of racism, guilty of sin, therefore. I think we need to look at life more through the lens of Galatians chapter 3, verses 29, excuse me, 26 through 30. Here's what it says. And so, so then in Christ, you are, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, red, nor white or black. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ... You are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. God is not going to be up in heaven. God is not up in heaven saying, okay, I'm letting this person in based off of skin color. He's not doing it. God teaches us not to show favoritism. We talked about our identity a few weeks ago. Remember 1 Peter 2.9, we we talked about that. You are a chosen people. If you're the people of God, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into wonderful light. I believe this is true, that our identity is found in Christ, not in our skin color. And when we build our lives around identity pieces, when those identity pieces fall, we get in big trouble. And we we did a whole series on this back a few months ago, but I just want to remind you of scriptures from Matthew. After Jesus had had done the, the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 through Matthew chapter 7, he ends with this. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, everything I've just told you, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Building your life on anything other than Christ has the potential for destruction. It doesn't mean that you don't have a career. It doesn't mean that you don't have a race. It doesn't mean that you don't have a gender. It doesn't mean any of those things. But it means if we build our lives on those things, we're in danger of a great crash coming because as much as they may be a part of our lives, you spend spend a lot of time of your day at work. You spend... We're part of different races. We're different genders, all those different things. Christ is what unifies. Christ is the foundation we build our lives upon. So I want to end with a couple of thoughts we've talked about the last couple of weeks that we must boldly hold fast to God's truth, the word of God. What does this thing tell us? If the Bible says that I'm born racist, then then we can have a conversation. It tells me that I'm born sinful. And there's lots of different sins. And I need to be careful. We would be wise to always understand we are all the image bearers of God. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what country you were born in doesn't matter what race you are, how old you are, how young you are. We're all created Imago Dei, the image. We are image bearers of God. That's who God says we are. Two, we must love and show grace to people who are in need of Jesus. Um, Just because maybe you haven't maybe had racist tendencies or shown, shown those towards people doesn't mean that people haven't experienced those. I remember talking to Mark Lopez, who used to attend here, and they moved away a while ago, African-American, long dreads. And he said there were times in Sioux City he felt a little singled out or felt he, people looked at him a little bit differently. And yeah, there are things that, that uh, 
that do happen. And I know there are a lot of general statements about things. You know, I, I think we can be honest about different things. Most, let me say that differently. It's very unlikely for me to be pulled over by a police officer because of my skin tone. There are some people who legitimately have been based solely off of a skin color. That doesn't mean that every single one. There are, there is racism in the past in our country. Racism in the past, maybe in your family, I don't know. All I know is this, is that what Jesus did on the cross for us sets us free and he forgives us. I don't know what your upbringing was. Um, you may have been taught to look through things a certain lens. I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor and we didn't have a lot of name calling of other races in our home anyway. Um, I know that's not every home. As we prepare our hearts to take communion together today, I think you and I should do some reflection. And if your instant reaction is, I'm not racist, if that's your instant reaction, it might be good to look in your heart. It's just good to look in our heart regardless. And so this morning, maybe it's not something you've thought about. Maybe it's something that makes you mad. I think we all hate being accused of things that we feel like we're not. Only you know in your heart what your thoughts are towards other people. But if you look at people through a lens of race and you judge them based off of you, you treat them differently, then you need, to, you need to ask God to forgive you of that. I think it's okay if there's anything in you. But I also think there's freedom for us in this room to know that we're all equal. God made us his image bearers. And we all need Jesus. Just a moment, I'm going to have you stand and we'll take me and Diane, you can come up if you want to. I want to genuinely just come before you as your pastor and ask you to do some introspection. There may be nothing in you. You may say, no, no, I've, I really, this is something I've thought long and hard about. I've went through, I went back through my mind when I see two people coming, I look at them the exact same. You may, you may be that way, that's great. But I think it's okay to honestly look within our hearts just as with any other sin. God, is there anything racial in me or racist tendencies that I may have or not have? And if not, great. But if there are, I think it'd be right for us to do this. But I want to encourage you as your pastor, when you see people, you see every person as an image bearer of God. The people you work with, the man or that woman that's standing outside of Walmart or on a bridge asking for money, they're made in the image of God too. Let's just take a moment as we prepare our hearts for communion. Now we've talked a little bit about critical race theory and how that affects us and the worldview, biblical worldview and some of those things this morning. Um, most important thing about us is that we know God. So I want to encourage you, let's make sure that we're right before God. I know we've talked about race, but if it's something else, maybe you've just been doing things you know you shouldn't be doing. You've been behaving in ways you shouldn't be behaving. You've been treating people in ways you shouldn't be treating them. Maybe you've just fallen into some bad habits again. I want to encourage you to, to ask God to forgive you. Let's just take a moment just take a moment to do that. Just in your seat, sitting down. God, is there anything in me? God, is my heart pure before you? 
Is there any sin in my heart? Are there any foul ways in me? God, forgive me for my sin. Make us pure, Lord. Lord, when we see people hurting, when we see injustice, when see, we see people being treated in ways that no human should ever be treated, things that are said that shouldn't be said, would we have the courage to stand up for them, to stand with them, whoever they are, wherever they're from, whatever race they are, whatever gender they are, whether they're young, whether they're old, that the people of God would love all people and love them well. We need your help and we need your grace to do that this morning.